to earth to redeem us unworthy ones into this wonderful fellowship with each other and with the, while the blood of Jesus thy son cleansing us from all unrighteousness we thank thee for everything that thou has done for us and we pray now that tonight you'll give us a great climax in this service may this be the night that I can see once more not a feeble person leave our building but what we make perfectly whole Save every sinner, God. Grant it. We commend ourselves unto thee in Jesus' name. Amen. And be seated. It's such people as yourself that makes this world a wonderful place to live and makes it so hard when we think that someday we'll have to leave it and separate for a little while. And then the glorious thought beyond that is to know we'll be together again then forever, where there'll be no more separation. This has indeed, as every meeting I've ever had been in Chicago, been a thrilling time for me to meet with God's people and have fellowship and to see our Lord Jesus making the sick well. And it's really been a wonderful time. I want to thank the ministers and especially Brother Joseph here, who is a bosom friend. And I have learned to love Brother Joseph with all my heart. And I think he knows that, and he loves me, and that's the reason he's asked me to come to Chicago. And I thank he and you all with all my heart for that wonderful invitation. It is true that I'm planning on moving right away. And I want to thank that, I think it was a man or a lady, I believe it was a lady today that, I don't know where she had a pre-thought of it or what, she sent me a letter and she owns a place up in Colorado, she wanted to deed it to me. And that's mighty lovely of you, my sister, if you're here tonight. And Billy coming around has given me little gifts that's come from each and every one of you, even to the boxes of cookies. <laughs> we appreciate that. Joseph's a little small for that, but Sarah and Rebecca makes up for it, so it sure will be appreciated every little thing, a little token. A man the other day gave my boy a, 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 a rifle. Now most, I, you know how I love hunting, and not only I love hunting, I just like to be out in the woods, and I, I just love it. And rifles and things that people has given me, I wouldn't take uh, nothing for them. There's nothing could buy them. Now, if I buy one myself and somebody come by and say, Brother Bram, I like that. Wish I had one. I'd say, go ahead and take it. But if somebody give it to me, <laughs> there couldn't be nothing take it. <laughs> You'd have to take it when I had my back turned. <laughs> yeah, the only way to get it. Because I appreciate anything, no matter what it is. And little things that you would think that didn't mean nothing. Maybe some people think they'd throw them out. Just little old trinkets and things. A little mussel shell from Africa. Something like that. I save every one of them. I remember them too. Because they come from somebody. Gypsy Smith, I believe it was, once said that. The greatest offering that he ever had outside of salvation 
said one night he was going to have a love offering taken up from it for him. I think, by the way, that's the reason he was put out of the Salvation Army, was taking a, an offering or something. No, it was something somebody gave him, a watch or something. I believe you're not supposed to do that in the Salvation Army. But said that all the people would had give him a love offering. And from the depths of their heart, they had done it. Many of those people's in glory tonight. And their reward is with them for helping that wonderful man of God. And he said one striking thing when he started to leave the audience that night, standing back behind the curtains was a little girl, ragged, and she had a little present wrapped up in her hand. And she said, give, Mr. Smith said, this is all I have, but this is my love offering to you. And when he got outside and unwrapped it, it was a, a lollipop that had been licked on a little bit. But she happened to think that she, it was all she had to give. He used to tell how he, how he got him. That's right. It's all she had. You know, the one who watched the widow put in the two pennies tithings that time, he seen that lollipop. Don't you believe so? Sure he did. He sees everything. No matter how insignificant it is, Jesus said, isn't two sparrow, isn't two sparrows sold for one farthing and a farthing is a fourth of a penny? Two sparrows. One farthing, one fourth of a penny will buy two sparrows. How insignificant. And said there's none of them, neither of them, no sparrow could even fall without your father knowing about it. He knows everything, doesn't he? Amen. So isn't it wonderful then just to lay our hearts right out before him? And I want to thank each and every one of you for your cooperation, you pastors. And if your pastor's not here and he spoke about the meeting or whatever, give him my love and regards. Uh, and sincerity and my prayer is for him that your church will be become a great spiritual lighthouse and great revival will be in your church each one of you and I don't care what church you belong to that doesn't matter a thing to me and I'm sure it doesn't to God either just you're the one he's after is you and a while ago and brother Joseph made mention that they would take a love offering for me for these nights that I've been here and I do appreciate it and perhaps the brethren are counting it now. And after the service, before I leave, they'll perhaps hand me the check for it. And I thank you. I wish I didn't have to take it. But I'm overseas, been overseas a lot now. And I have no capital. And I just have to have a meeting here in America once in a while. My expenses runs me about $100 a day for office and everything, regardless of where I am. And I go way, 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 way back in debt. Then I'll have a few meetings. They'll give me love offerings. I get back caught up. Then somebody come along and wants to sponsor me overseas. Away I go to preach the gospel. And the last two times there's been the Christian businessman and them has sent me over where I didn't have to have one cent. They can't give me money because that would be a gift to me, but they can pay my way. And I'm so thankful for that. And that someone offered me the other day, they'd send me back overseas to Palestine when the Lord would lead me to go. And that's very fine. So I'm thankful for that. And for all things, I'm grateful. And above all things, I'm grateful for Jesus Christ, who makes it possible that we can come together. Brother Joseph is talking about my home, my wife. If there's any credit to be given to any Branham, give it to my wife. That's right. She's the deserving one. 36 years old, tall, completely white-headed. A girl, she never knows what it is to lay down. And we have a hard time <clears throat> in our country. That's my hometown. Pardon me. <clears throat> That's where I was born, uh, raised at. She tried this week with any price that she could give to anyone who would come and watch Joseph while she came up here and spent these last couple nights with us. I've offered women as much as $35 and $40 a week in expenses that they'd come and do nothing but take care of the children. We can find no one. <clears throat> that's not been for a week or two. That's been for two or three years. And so it's seemingly that the Holy Spirit is moving me away from Jeffersonville. I'm watching for a place now where he wants me to go. And uh, Chicago's all right with me if he moves me this way or wherever I would go. So I'm just in prayer, and you pray for me that I'll make the right decision. But I can hardly stay any longer. And 
And it looks like other things, too, that nothing, no one's got against me as I know of. If it was, I'd sure be on their doorsteps in the morning finding out about it. But it's the Holy Spirit. You remember, Jacob, things begin to go wrong, see? And he had a longing, and, and everything is a little different, so he just had to move away. So go back to the homelands. So wherever the Holy Spirit will lead, all right. Now, this is my vacation time before the big struggle comes this uh, next year. This is the time that the Christian businessman, this year, as they did last year, is sponsoring a, a little trip for me, a trip that I couldn't afford to go. That's down the Salmon River, San, uh, the river of no return. You float through a raft ten days, down over the riffles, even the 30 feet drops. Very rough trip, but you're back in God's country. And I love it. And I've a, now I leave, I'm at home four hours this time before leaving for a month. And I go down this river of no return, the good Lord willing, and down in there I take my rifle of a morning sometimes before daylight and swell way alone into the mountain. Set my rifle down. Sit down on top of the mountain where I could look out. And there I talk to God for the rest of the day. Sometimes stay two days, maybe more than that, right there under that tree or wherever I'll be, or in a rock. It isn't so much hunting, it's getting alone with God. I'll be praying for you. God bless you. May his, he who can keep the moon bright, make the stars shine when it's dark to give us a way to walk. May he be with you now until we meet again. God bless you all. And I wish now to turn in the scripture here to read a, a little text. And if I have left out anything, oh, one thing, this fine fellow here, the custodian, such a nice fella. He knew me and has been very nice to me, and I appreciate him with all my heart. And he makes me so welcome. And the Lane Tech High School Board who lets us come here, God bless them. May this school produce the best that any school could on the grounds of America, is my prayer. God be with them. They open their doors for these things. If you ever have a program, I can come and help you. I'll sure do it. If I, some of the officials are listening, I'll do anything I can to help you because I know you'll be blessed. You've opened the doors to the gospel. Thank you so much. And then I've got a little bunch of unseen friends sitting down here tonight. Wish I could call all their names. I can't. But they sure support me with prayer and so forth and sitting down here in the orchestra pit. I don't know. They might be a musician down there, too. I don't believe them fellows are musicians. I believe they're just... If you just looked here plastered over the top of here, you know they're a recording artists that go down here and record these messages. And so I know Brother Beeler, and I know the man sitting next to him. I can't call his name. He's a missionary to the Jews or Arabs or one. And, of course, Leo and Jean sitting here, my co-workers in the gospel, and Brother Ahmet. And the other brother here, he drives down my tabernacle every day. He knows I'm going to be there, and I don't. What is your name, brother? Is Smith, is it? Smith. And um, comes way up here around Hammond or Geary or somewhere with a little old car. And I, somebody looked into the day, a brand new car, and he's got about 80-something thousand miles on it. Most of that's between here and Jeffersonville, driving back and forth. And I know this brother's face, but I can't call his name. And many of you know your face, but I just can't call your name. I've got some colored friends sitting here tonight also, down here, new recording down here. The Lord bless you all. Thank you, Brother Joseph. I had a little hoarseness. In I know. Thank you. Now, we love him with all of our hearts. So tonight, we're going to take a little scripture lesson, and then I want to try to... Have, be, have a prayer line going and for tomorrow's Monday and you've got to go to work and you've got to catch trains out and I've kept you late every night and you forgive me for that, will you? And uh, a lot of times I get so enthused when I start, could I call it preaching? <laughs> uh, anyhow, when I'm having a good time, well then I get so enthused I lose all thoughts of time and everything. So you've been very nice to stay with me. And it just makes me love you with all my heart. Now, I want to read some words out of God's Bible in 1 John, the first chapter, and the fifth verse to the seventh. And 
I believe we'll just read the seventh verse, and that will make it shorter. You read the whole chapter when you get home, if you can. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that marvelous? Let's ask him to bless the reading of his word now. Heavenly Father, bless thy word tonight. And may go out to every heart and find a dwelling place and never leave no more. Grant it, Lord. And now circumcise the lips of the unworthy person that's to speak and circumcise all the ears of these people who are to hear and get glory out of the service. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy loving Son. Amen. Now I want to speak to you just a little while tonight. This has been such a wonderful week upon the way to have fellowship. Now we know that I was going to continue my service tonight. The children of Israel over in the homeland. Joshua taking them over where we left last night when he was crossing this, the Red Sea. But I wouldn't have time in this prayer line so he can uh, catch trains and so forth and get home and go to work in the morning. Now, this would be short. We can talk to you just short on this. But how that uh, every person desires fellowship. I've never seen anyone yet who did not desire fellowship. That is, was, was all right, mentally balanced. Now, you might want to pick your fellowship. Of course, that's true to every one of us. That's the reason tonight that all these fine people have packed out here in this building to a place where they're standing is because that they like this type of fellowship. They like Christian fellowship. And that's why we come tonight to fellowship around the Word. I love the Word, don't you? And you know why you love the Word? You have the Holy Spirit in you. For the Bible said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So the Holy Spirit feeds on the Word. And then when you hear the word, everyone wants to hear it. No matter every little piece of literature they can pick up, they, they read it and they listen to the radio and they go to church and so forth because they are longing for that fellowship around the word. And may God help us tonight to realize how we can have a perfect fellowship. No matter where storms come, whether you're right or wrong, you can still have fellowship. And only way you can have fellowship as your love perfects. Don't never forget me if I don't see some of you no more. Remember this, that my theme is love covers it all. I believe in the redeeming love of the Lord Jesus. I like this song. Ever since by faith I saw the streams I flowing wounds supplied, redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Yes. I'd rather have a church. Listen, just a moment. I would rather have a church that knows nothing about any spiritual gift and just be so in love with each other and with Christ. I'd rather have that than ever spiritual gift operating in the church. Now, that might sound hard in a Pentecostal group, but I would rather have it. Where there is gifts, they'll fail. Where there is gifts, they'll bring confusion. Where there is gifts, they can be questioned. But where there is love, it is perfect. That's right. And if you had perfect love, you'd have perfect gifts. That's right. So work first with love. That brings fellowship. And fellowship brings gifts. Now... The reason, why is it that people perhaps like different things, like fellowship, is because first man was made to fellowship. I just think of tonight, as much as I long to go hunting and fishing in the outdoors, yet my heart is more hungry to get on top of that mountain and talk to God than anything I know of. Yeah, I, I want to be alone. I want to know there's nobody a hundred miles from me. I love people. But the only way I can minister to people is to first get the message from God. 
And I know this one thing, that my faith tells me that every person that's born again that I preach to, I'll have an eternity to fellowship with them. But we want to bring more in out of the darkness. There's our poor lost brothers and sisters out here tonight in saloons. I passed by Skid Row last night as my boy and them wanted to sit and see those poor people down there drinking and think that they don't, they don't know what they do want. I thought if they only knew my Jesus, they sure wouldn't be down there, see? And that's the only thing that can save them from that chaos that they're in. There's no medicine, nothing. An alcoholic is a perfect, total annihilation from any help at all outside of Jesus Christ. That's right. There's no cure. I've been on the Bowery. I've been in Pig Alley in France to the lowest slums that I could find and talking and praying and so forth. And the only hope for them people is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing. The only hope. Now, what makes man want to fellowship is because he was made that way. He was made to have fellowship. What fellowship is, I got four days driving to do starting tomorrow. I got four days to drive to about 2,500 miles and I have to drive it by myself in a little old truck. And someone, a friend of mine, is coming down, just left word this afternoon, to ride all the way out there with me and ride back by himself on a Greyhound bus just to have fellowship. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I appreciate friends like that. God bless his little Swiss heart. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> Wanting to ride just to be with me four days across the mountains and prairies over yonder just to have fellowship. We love each other dearly as dearly beloved brothers. And then have to ride all the way back up to Shawano, Wisconsin on a bus or somehow just to get back. Oh, that makes my heart jump. And now if God is so longing to have fellowship with his children that he come all the way from glory and died to have fellowship with us. Isn't that marvelous? So wonderful to think. Now in the beginning, man had fellowship. First, we realize if we can have fellowship with God, then don't worry. God will take care of the rest of it. The main thing I want to speak on I've got it in four parts here, how to have fellowship with God, fellowship with one another, and so forth. But we want to talk only on the one phase of it, is a fellowship with God. And now I'm going to watch that clock there to be sure that I get the prayer line started in time. But fellowship with God is what the first and original fellowship that human beings had was with God. There wasn't even another... Another living creature on the earth that he could fellowship with Adam but God. Then God made him a helpmate, a wife, which is part of him. And could you imagine in the evenings when the sun had gone down, going setting way back in the west, and that streaks of light coming down through those great evergreen trees, God's great cathedral, and he, the roar went along through the top of the trees and Adam and Eve sitting out there in the garden in God's great cathedral having fellowship with God. Everybody longs to do that. Every Christian longs to have fellowship. Isn't that right? I've read stories of man who spent a lifetime nearly going high into the hills, going down to the lakeside, just hunting for a spot for fellowship. But after all, you don't have to go anywhere but to Calvary. That's the only way. There's a way. There's only one way that you can go to fellowship. And notice, then not way, there hasn't only been in this age, it's been in all ages. Just think Job, way, the oldest book in the Bible. He longed for fellowship. He knew there was a creator. And he believed him with all his heart. And he said it in a child way of saying it, Oh, if I could only get to him. If I only knew where he lived at, I could go up and knock on his door and talk to him just a little while. Wouldn't we all love to do that? But think he's closer to you than his door. His door is your heart. And he's so close tonight, he's closer to you than your right arm is. He's part of you. And if we can only realize that he's here and how he wants to have fellowship with us, 
His heart is greater for fellowship than ours are. And the reason makes us that way, because we're offsprings of his. That's what makes us long for fellowship. That's what makes a mother would die for her baby. Why? That's what makes a father would give his life for his wife. A husband, a true husband, would give his life for his wife. Why? Because Christ gave his life for the church, his wife. It's a strain in you. And it make a mother dash through a burning fire, not thinking about her own self and her hair on fire and her clothes on fire, to grab her baby and run out with it. Why? It's love of a parent. And God is the first and original parent. And that's where that strain comes through, because the woman gave birth to the child. And that's the reason God's come down, manifested in the flesh, and went to the very flames of hottest of suffering, that he might bring us into fellowship with him. Taking no thought of his own, not my will, thine be done. How that wonderful fellowship that we have with each other and with God. Now, God intended this fellowship. So what separated, what keeps man from having that direct talk like Adam did? I've often thought that Adam out in the Garden of Eden, knowing no sin, or Eve, his wife, beautiful, standing in the garden. And then... Leo, the lion, would come up, and here comes the tiger, the great beast of the, of the fields, come up into this cathedral, kneeling on their knees, and they, even, even the beast didn't have any killing about them. They, they was no, no, no death nowhere. The devil's what makes wild animals wants to hurt you. And if you can produce in your heart the right kind of a love towards the most Horrible beast there is in the woods or the deserts, that beast won't harm you. That's right. I know it by experience. But you can't pretend it. He knows whether you do or not. There's something about him and he knows it. But if you're really not afraid, I've never seen anything that would hurt you. No matter a lion, whatever it might be, he'll walk away from you. But if you run or act like you're scared or something, then you'll get killed. So you can't just make it up. You've got to really know it in your heart that you're not afraid. That's the trouble with man tonight. That's what's the trouble with people tonight. You're scared. That's the biggest curse there is on the full gospel people or any other people is because they are afraid. God has made the provision, but you're afraid to take his word for it. If you was, wasn't afraid tonight, why, you would take your healing by faith and know that God promised it, and the thing would just go plumb away from you. Afraid, scared. And I've noticed it. And that's the reason I'm such a believer in healing. I know that if you can get away from that scare and get love in its place, something's going to happen. There's only two faculties that govern a human, and one of them is, is faith, which brings results, and the other is fear, which has no value in it at all. Faith is of God. Fear is of the devil. Fear makes you weary. Fear makes you wonder. And if I was going to die in the morning, what good would it do me to get all stewed up about it? What if I was going to be electrocuted in the morning? And my life had to end tomorrow morning. What good would that do me to worry about it? Well, you say, what good would it do to have faith? Faith can sign my pardon. Sure, there's value in faith. Don't be weary. Don't be scared. Don't be upset. Just have faith and believe. And the only way you can have faith, you have to have love first, for love produces faith. For perfect love, yes. Perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. Wish I had time to tell you the experiences with wildlife of what I've seen conquered by faith, by love. I told you the other night about the old possum being sent up. I seen a vicious bull one day was going to kill me. This is on record. I was a game warden at the time. I was going over the hill to pray for a sick man. Well, we're supposed to pack a gun, but you wouldn't go to pray for a sick man with a gun on your hand. 
So I tucked the gun and laid it in the little old truck and crossed over through the field, and I was way out in the field, and I knew, I had a, ought to have thought that this killer bull was out there. He had just killed a colored man on a farm, Mr. Burks, just about three months before that, and had sold him up there to the people that had these Durham cattle. And then when I started across the field, right out in a big open field, and not over about 30 yards from me, this big fellow raised up and threw his horns down and let out a big beller, if you know what I'm talking about. And there he was, horns about like this, and here he come. At first it scared me. I, I looked for a tree and there wasn't any tree. And I know he could outrun me to the fence. So I thought, well, this is it. So then something happened. Oh, God. If that would only stay there instead of going away. Something happened. I I wish God would let it happen to everybody here tonight just long enough to get healed. Something happened that I wasn't scared of the bull. I felt sorry because I disturbed him. I was in his field. He was laying out there not bothering me. I come along and woke him up. And so I felt sorry for him. Now, you can't bluff it. It has to be there. That's the way faith is. You can't bluff. You've got to really have it. The devil will know it. <laughs> and this fellow started towards me with his head down just as hard as he could. I was no more afraid of that bull than I would be of any of my dear brothers and sisters standing on this platform. And he run within about five feet of me, and he stopped. He looked at me so depleted, he looked right and left. I said, fella, I'm sorry I disturbed you. I said, now you're God's creature and I'm God's servant. Now the Creator that made you made me, and I am His servant. I'm on my journey across the hill to pray for one of His sick children. If I knowed you'd been laying there, I wouldn't have come by and disturbed you. So now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Creator, go back and lay down. At the judgment bar, you'll sit brought into light. That bull looked at me a few minutes, turned around, walked over, and laid down. And I I stood there, the tears running down my cheeks. I walked within five foot of that bull, and he ever even turned his head and looked at me. Why? Instead of hating him, I loved him. Love will conquer anything. Right? That's what conquered my heart when I know that God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that I wouldn't have to perish. Know that I was born in this world a sinner and was perishing. And God loved me that he gave his son for my life to be redeemed. And then I I, I couldn't hate no more. I had to love. That's what brings these results that you see. It's love. I don't know. I might have told this. I have told it before. Hundreds of little things has happened. One day I was mowing my yard. I had to get in the backyard, the front yard's growing up before I get the back. Now people come being prayed for and things. From, see, as Joseph said a while ago, it's just, here, this is just, this is just Chicago. At home, it's all around the world. <laughs> see, where people are coming and going from all parts of the world coming in. And when I was mowing this grass and I run in, forgot about it, there's a hornet's nest back there. And I hit that fence with this mowing machine and, uh, I was covered over with horns, some great big fellows. They'll knock you down when they hit you. At first, I was scared, truly. No shirt on. And something other happened. I, I was sorry I hit those fellows, not because it, I was afraid it was going to get stung, but it, really, it sounds juvenile. But if we could just be more juvenile, if we could be more childlike, it's the simplicity of God that turns college students around. Be simple in those things. Just like a baby. Just rely and believe. Don't try to push yourself. Just relax and believe it. So don't try to work yourself up. Oh God, how do you rebuke? That's no, no good. No, just believe it and walk on. That's all. So when that happened, I thought, and poor little fellows up there in their nest now, and here I done hit the fence and knocked them out of their nest. That big old mowing machine I was pushing. And I said, you little creatures of God, I'm sorry that I hit this fence. 
I, I'm sorry I disturbed you. Now, I'm God's servant, and I'm praying for his sick children. i got to hurry and mow this yard. So now you rush right back into your nest. I won't bother you no more. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I started my mower off again and stopped it. I pulled a string and started off like that. And then bees just a-humming all around my naked shoulders. And they took a beeline and went right back into their nest. Not singing at all. Love. I can't produce it. I can't work it up. God's got to give it. There's where it is tonight. God has to give it. Then love produces a fellowship. Now when God said back there the day that sin had separated that divine love, God told Adam and Eve not to eat these certain fruits and they did, and sin brought separation, and sin by separation brought hatred, malice, strife, envy. Is that right? Yes. What happened? They separated from divine love. And when you separate from divine love, then you can't overlook your brother's mistakes no more. You've got to ball him out for it. That's right. <laughs> You can't overlook sister's mistakes no more because you've got away from that divine part, that love part. But if you really love the Lord Jesus, if sister or brother does something to you, oh, well, that's all right. They didn't mean to do it. That's the kind of love that Christ had. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What if he had helped my sins against me? What an awful person I was, but he loved me so well that he forgave me for them. When I was undone, he forgave me. He loved me. A pure love. And when Adam separated himself from pure love of keeping God's word in his heart, when he did that, then he began these other faculties come in. Malice, envy, strife, hatred, so forth. Now, when God seen that his children had separated, he come down for fellowship. And there was no one there to welcome him. You remember the other night when I preached on the woman washing Jesus' feet? He was unwelcome by the Pharisees. He's unwelcome tonight in many people. He's unwelcome in many churches, many cities. Look, when Israel was dividing up their lands, there was, I believe it was Gad was one of them, and perhaps uh, the half-tribe, they didn't go over into the promised land. They stayed on this side, borderline. Jesus visited that same people. And look at the results of staying out of the full benefits of God's love. When Jesus visited them, he went over in Gadaria. That's where they were dwelt. That's where they, made, that's where they come from, right there. And their attitude was still the same way. Because at... They had cost them a bunch of hogs to have the meeting. They asked Jesus to leave their land. They didn't want nothing to do with it. They had their own ways. They had their own churches. They didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. So they asked him to leave the land. But he went anyhow because there was one soul calling for him. Just think, cross that stormy lake over across there to find one soul in need. That was his love for one needy soul. He'll come from glory tonight to this school auditorium for one needy soul that'll believe him. And so then when sin came in, it separated man from fellowship. Notice what God did to bring man back to fellowship. He introduced to the world a blood redemption. God killed animals and put further skin showing a blood redemption, and there God, after being separated from His, from his uh, creatures, God laid out the welcome mat back home by the shedding of the blood. And that was then and has been and will always be God's provided preparation for fellowship with Him is through the shed blood. Amen. Friend, listen to me in just a few moments because I see I've got 12 minutes yet. Look, I want to ask you, they have, cried, they have tried hard to substitute education for that blood. It'll never work. They have tried hard to substitute denomination to bring fellowship. 
educate people. The world today. As Brother Tommy Hicks, that wonderful little brother, was here today giving us his story back in behind the Iron Curtain. There, Russia, in all of its culture and science, trying to bring a fellowship through communism, through uh, science and culture, and denying the blood of Jesus, when the blood of Christ is the only way that you can have fellowship. Amen. Nothing will take its place. Thanks be to God. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be intelligent. You just have to have a humble, submitted heart. Think of it. He introduced blood. Now, I want you to watch closely now. We're speaking of Job a while ago. Job used this same preparation. The oldest book in the Bible, even before Genesis was written, Job was written. And Job was a righteous man, a man who feared God. And troubles came to him. But I want you to notice just before the troubles come, Job made preparations for this trouble. Listen, friend, sinner friend, there's trouble right ahead of you tonight. And that's the valleys of the shadows of death. You better make preparations for the only friend who can walk with you through that. Amen. Right? Make preparations for it. Job had a bunch of daughters and sons. And when he knew that they were out like birds, people raise up children today. I feel sorry for fathers and mothers today, being a parent myself. And knowing one reason, I'm trying to get my children away from our city. We don't have any Christian schools there. And I want to get them somewhere where they'll be brought up in school. In a real fundamental school. Where they'll learn to love the Lord. The teaching that I can give them around home, yet they get out with that worldly crowd. The devil is a shrewd fellow and he pushes that into them. If you can keep them under the Spirit until they get old enough to receive the Holy Ghost and know what it's all about, then God will take care of the rest of it. But first, they got them little adolescent days. Now, every person thinks of their children. While they're under your, your wings, you can watch them. But once out from under the wings, then the devil's got every little old Oscar he can out there to associate with your children that's infidelic and mean and devilish and everything else. God help us. This juvenile delinquency here in New York, Chicago, and these big cities, what the papers is writing up, how they kill one another and everything. Little children, little boys and girls, killing and murdering and shooting and so forth like that. If those poor little kiddies only realized that that's the devil. Sure. What brought on juvenile delinquency was parent delinquency. The parent failing to take care of the children. You remember a few years ago when my boy was born. That's been about, I think he's about 19 now. I remember the doctor told my wife, said, just let that kid squall. Said it ain't going to hurt him. And if grandma comes along to pick him up, said, take her, keep her hands off of him. Said he ought to be crib broke at six months old. Now, you know better than that. Sounds like a talking of a witch doctor instead of a real doctor. And then you know what it hatched out? It hatched out a bunch of neurotics and a bunch of gangsters. Listen, God gave you that baby to love. I don't care how bad you spoil it. Love it anyhow. That's right. Love it. If you don't love it now, it'll grow up in a cold home and indifferent. And it'll seek love somewhere or something. It'll make an outlight for somewhere. Mother, take that baby and give it fellowship and love now. Make it a part of you, which it is. And act like it and hug it and kiss it and, and, and love it. Don't be too cold with the things of the world. God gave you that as a treasure. Raise it right. Amen. Notice. That's what's the matter. We got away from the things of God. You get away from nature, and then you're out of the will of God. Now, I want you to notice then, Job, thinking of his children, he said, Now, peradventure, when they go out, they might sin. So he offered the only preparation that he knowed about was a burnt sacrifice, the shedding of blood. And he shed the blood of a lamb 
for his children making preparation if they did sin. You see it? Job was mindful of his children to make a preparation for their sin. And mother and father, if we would quit spending money on our children learning tap dancing and things like that, and some kind of how to be an actor, and put more time of pleading the blood of Jesus up over them, and showing them love and fellowship, we'd get along better. The child would too. Teach your child. I believe if every parent would take their child and the first the parent come back to God and take the beer out of the ice box and take the cards off the table, or oh, you say it's innocent, you see what it hatches out? Brother, I wouldn't let a card light on my ground. No, sir. It's a devil's thing. Keep away from it. You say you're old-fashioned, Brother Branham. Well, it was an old-fashioned gospel save me. Amen. 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 It's old-fashioned salvation that makes me happy. Amen. It was old-fashioned Holy Ghost that healed me. Amen. It's the same thing that's going to take us home to glory. Amen. Sure. Teach your child. Looky here. Look what the world can do. Now, this is little clean things, I suppose. I ain't got nothing to do with it. But look here. Every kid in town could tell you who David Crockett was. My, my. It's on his teaspoons, on his hat, on his tie, everywhere. David Crockett. The world taught the children, America by a fad, taught all the children about David Crockett. They can tell you from Tennessee when he was born, all about he wore a coonskin cap, killed a bear when he was three and all these kind of fiction things. They know all about David Crockett. And you're willing and like to tell them about it. Well, if they could learn about David Crockett and dress like David Crockett and act like David Crockett, surely you could teach them about Jesus Christ and they would act like Jesus Christ and love Jesus Christ as well as they could love David Crockett. Fellowship around the Bible. Tell them Jesus loves them. David Crockett is true, but now killing a bear at three years old, I doubt that. <laughs> but a lot of those things. We leave a lot of fiction. A lot of them stories are fiction. Here, when I was a little boy, I had such admiration for William Tell. He shot an apple off his boy's head. When I got down there in Switzerland, there's not a word of it true. It's all fiction. <laughs> That's right. It was William Tell, truly, but never shot no apple off his boy's head. No. No nothing about it. But it's just fiction and, and stories it's told. Let's get the truth to the people. Let's not fellowship with that. Let's fellowship with God and with the Bible and with the Holy Spirit. Make preparations for our children. And notice, when the trials finally come and Job went through the testing. Oh, I love it. Excuse me, I'm not emotional, but I just get the feeling good. I love it. Testing. God testing His children. Don't you love it? Every trial is a testing proving ground. This is a testing time. God testing His people. Getting them ready. Before you buy a team of horses, you go out and test them, check them. Let them pull a while. Run them, see if they're wind broken, got lemons in their nose, and so forth. Oh, you didn't know you put lemons in a nose for a wind broken horse? <laughs> you do. <laughs> All right. About your automobile, doctor it up with ca castor oils and fine oils, and the motor's real thick, take a knock out of it so you can sell it. See? All these other things, testing. God puts his children through the testing. I'm so happy for it. So he can show his love to you. Now, the testing, Job went on the test block for God. He hadn't sinned. They said he had sinned, but he didn't. Why did he know he hadn't sinned? He knowed he had come the only way there was to come through the shed blood. He had made a sacrifice. He confessed his sins up on the basis of the shed blood. He knowed he was justified in the sight of God no matter what anybody said. He knew he was just because he was justified by his faith in God's provided 
sacrifice. He believed it. All right. And when the testings come, it proved out to be true. God took everything he had. He took his children, killed all them, took all his cattle and sheep, camels, killed all them, done everything and broke his own body out, took his health. But he still loved the Lord. Because he had come God's way and had made connections with God. And once you connect God through the shed blood, you know that there's something to it. You're not taking theology. You're taking what the blood witnesses to you. There you are. And notice, God restored to him all that he lost. It doubled. He doubled his sheep. He doubled his camels. But you notice, he just gave him seven children. Just what he had. What children was that? Is the same children he had lost. They were under the blood. They were in glory waiting for him. That's the way to have our children, isn't it? That's right. Give him back his children. Sure, he's with them tonight. And will be forevermore. Israel had the shed blood of the Lamb. The only way and the only place that Israel could worship was under the shed blood. All the sacrifices and everything was brought into one common place. And there on the brazen altar, they burnt the bodies and sprinkled the blood. And God, listen, here it is now. God only met Israel under the shed blood. The only meeting place that God makes His people under the shed blood. No other way. He won't meet you in your denomination. He won't, as good as it may be. He won't meet you with your education, your theology, as good as it may be. He'll only meet you under the shed blood. The only place that God met Israel was under the shed blood. The only way he could talk to Adam and Eve, under the shed blood. The only way he could talk to Job, under the shed blood. And the only way, notice, the people had to come to the place where the blood was shed. Get it? And the only way you'll ever have that perfect fellowship with God is come to the place where the blood was shed. Where is it? Christ is God's meeting place. We meet together and set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit moves into the building when we're under the blood. How do we get in Christ Jesus? The first, the elements that came from His body is what we go into His body by. There came from His body water, blood, spirit. Spirit is the thing that brings you in. The preparation of the blood is what cleanses of the waters of separation. As a red heifer was burnt and made waters of separation. And every believer coming to the temple first stopped in the courts. Just a moment. Stop in the courts for the waters of separation was kept there and they were sprinkled. The waters of separation is the word. The word of God. The waters of separation. Through the washing of the water by the word. You come and hear the word and the first thing it does it separates you to move your thoughts from the evil to the good. Then the next thing they did after leaving the course, they come toward the temple. On the temple in the wilderness was seven strokes of blood that was stuck by the high priest's finger at the dying of the heifer and stroked across the door showing that every believer coming to this fellowship was first recognized as a substitute died and prepared a way before him. Every man that cometh into this wonderful fellowship first must faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word, then recognize the blood of Jesus Christ, God's welcome mat back home to fellowship. And you must recognize the blood was shed for you, his life was given here on earth that you might have fellowship. Then the Holy Spirit, as you come behind the veil into the curtains here, baptizes you the water, blood, spirit. Baptizes you into the body of Christ. Then, here it is, brother, sister. Listen closely now. We're closing. 
That's when you'll never call him Holy Roller no more. No. Once get behind the curtain that is his flesh. Let the Holy Spirit cleanse you by the blood, bring you into Christ. Then you have fellowship. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin at the door. Now we have fellowship one with another. Think of it. A Methodist brother can shake my hand as a Baptist and a Pentecostal and a Nazarene and a Pilgrim Holiness, Presbyterian, whatever we are, we can shake one another's hands and have fellowship one with another when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Hope you see it. My time's passed. That's why we're here. God sent His Son. Don't you believe it? He gave His Son that we might live. The Son had to shed His blood. He resurrected His body. His body and bones is in the presence of God tonight. But His blood still stains the earth. And through that shed blood come forth the life is in the blood and the life is the Holy Ghost which has come back, Jesus said, a little while, listen, and the world will see me no more. Yet you shall see me, for I'll be fellowshipping with you to the end of the world. I, personal pronoun, will be fellowshipping. I'll be with you. Wherever two or three are gathered together, I'll be in their midst. Fellowshipping. With you to the end of the world. Do you recognize that he's raised from the dead tonight, Christian brother? Sinner friend of mine, I love you. God knows I don't want you to be a sinner. God don't want you to be a sinner. But would you like to enjoy a real fellowship like you've never had before? It'll be a cup of coffee and a cigarette anytime. It'll be to drink a whiskey or a crowsing night to spoil the morals of some girl or whatever. Won't you come tonight? Say, God, be merciful for me, a sinner. I want fellowship. I want to get something in my life that's real. Amen. Jesus is real. He's raised from the dead. He'll be right here at the platform in a few minutes doing the same things he did back there to prove to you people that he sure wants fellowship. You won't doubt him anymore, will you? Let's have fellowship tonight. Won't you do it? Don't doubt him no more. Say, God, here you are. I'm right now fellowshipping. This is the time. I'm taking you at your word. You're speaking to me, not through Brother Brandon, but through your Bible. Then your gift is speaking through this way to recognize through a human body that you are here. And I've got fellowship with you. And I'm going to walk out of here tonight, believe me, with all my heart. Shall we bow our heads? The pianist, if you will, get come to the piano just for a moment. While we have our heads bowed, everybody praying. I just wonder tonight, sinner friend, are you really longing for something that you've never had? You're longing for a thrill. You drive your car at 90 miles an hour, squeak your tires around. Lady, you, you dress any way you can to get boys to whistle at you. And you think it's thrilling? You really want an everlasting thrill tonight? Come to Jesus. You want somebody to love you that will never quit loving you? Come to Him. Won't you do it? If you've never had this wonderful fellowship, you don't know really what it is to have a real friend. I know one's waiting to receive you right now. And while we have our heads bowed, being my last night here, I would like to ask you something. Everyone in praying that knows how to pray, Sinner friend, would you raise your hand to God and say, God, I'd really like to have that fellowship with you. Would you just raise your hand everywhere in the building, upstairs, downstairs. Just, that's right. God bless you. That's God bless you. You. I want fellowship, God. God bless you, sister. Let's see. I want fellowship, Lord. My religion has been cold. I just went to church. That's about all I've done. But I really not know what it was to really call you into my life and fellowship with you. Here's my hand, God. Take me tonight. I want fellowship. I'm coming through the blood right now. I'll raise my hand. And by faith, I'll receive it. Will you raise your hand? Somebody else. God bless you, son. God bless you, sister. God bless you. You. That's right. My, many of you. Down on the bottom floor here. God bless you. God bless you. You, you, you. 
over here to my left. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, brother. God bless you back there. Yes, over to my right. Lord, here's my hand. I'm right now by faith. I've come to these meetings. I've been around. I, I kind of wondered. I've doubted. I went to church. I tried to live a good life, but God really, I, I've never known what it was to sit down and talk with you and love you and just, just get so interested in praying until I can't get up. And I love you and I'll stand there and cry and raise my hands up to you and my heart just is jumping for joy. I've never had that, Lord. Never see you come down and answer my prayer and do something for me and, and make a way for me when it's all dark and I don't know which way to go and you come and just open up the way and keep me full of act. Lord, I've never had that fellowship, though I've been to church, but I want it right now and I'm coming by the way of the blood, the way Brother Brandon spoke with the Bible, I'll raise my hand. Anyone else? Right now, let's just raise your hand to God. I'm coming this way, Lord. God bless you too. Yes. Down in the pit, is there anybody down in here tonight? Say, God, I'm coming for that fellowship. I want it really in the bottom of my heart. God bless you, too. God bless you, sister. I see your hand. God sees it. God bless you, my sister. Yeah, fellowship. That's fine. All right. A little word of prayer now. At the service is over, they'll give an altar call. If you'd like to come around the altar and pray a while, be fine. Heavenly Father, these who are coming, no one would raise their hand, of course, Lord, lest something knock at their heart in this cruel, dark, evil day that we're living. How that men and women has got away from me, how the world through culture and through science has moved plumb out of the category of God. And we're looking today at the city and looking there and seeing the buildings begin to cr- break down, seeing the streets breaking in, showing... Many years ago, they were, they were good streets, good buildings, but they're getting old now. The old world all over is just sitting, waiting for judgment. God, you'll have to come pretty soon and it'll all be over. Just like some woman or man that's lived their life in sin, sitting in a corner with a haggard look and waiting for death and grinning in their teeth and would do anything evil if they could. A wretched person waiting for their judgment, their eternal destination to be pronounced upon them. How it could be different. How they could even be old but yet neatly and lovely an old mother served her life for God in purity and womanhood waiting for her reward. God be merciful. Please, dear God, these people go in their pockets. They help me to live. They pay for my children's food. They, God, I just don't know what to say. My heart beats. Not that they hear me, but that you, Lord. I pray that you forgive every one of them and bring them into a perfect fellowship this night. Do that, God, for me, won't you? I love you. And you said if I asked anything, you would do it. And then heal all the sick tonight, won't you, Father? You're here at the platform just now. And I know that you'll do these things. And open the eyes of those people tonight. Maybe many has never seen you work in your great powers. But may they see the Lord Jesus in his great fellowship. And in the Bible, on the morning of the first resurrection, there was two men, Cleopas and his friend, went walking to Emmaus. Jesus walked with them all day. That night when he got inside with him, he'd done something just a little different from what ordinary man does. They knew that nobody could do that but Jesus, and they recognized him by the sign that he'd done. May it be so here in Chicago tonight, Lord. There's many people sitting here from fine big churches here in the city. Maybe there are members there but never been born again. Do something a little different tonight, Lord, to bring their hearts closer to thee, for we ask it in his name. Amen. I wonder, sister, while we're getting prayer cards, you know that song, My Faith Looks Up to Thee? Could you give us a call? How many knows that my faith looks up to thee? I just love it. Just while we're relaxing a second, let's call the prayer cards. Billy, where are you at? Prayer cards, how many? Let me see that. How many? Hundreds? All right. Let's start from number one and go to about... Yeah. Did you have what I'll do? Yeah. Yeah. All right.
All right, you are here today to get the teaching has prayer part two. Start from number one. Who has it? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. My faith loves you love him. How many wants that to be in your heart? Pure your love, pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. Faith of our fathers living still. How wonderful. Always remember, friends, love changes things. Just love. It'll do the work. Now, love him when you come. Now, don't criticize him when he begins to move. Just love him. Embrace him. Say, I love you, Lord. Now, for the last time, so I can hurry and get the line to you as quick as I can. As soon as the anointing gets started, I'll start praying quickly for the people. Everybody, believe with all your heart, Jesus make you well. Remember, he's raised from the dead. He said that I do nothing in myself but what I see the Father doing. What the Father shows me, that I do. Speaking with the woman, he told her her sins. And speaking with Nathaniel, he told him where he was at. Speaking with Peter first, he told him where his name, where his name was, who his father was. And many other times in the Bible, and Jesus said himself, now so that you'll clearly understand, I do nothing except the Father shows me first. If he's raised from the dead, he does the same thing, not just as the Father will show. Now, I'm a man. So was he a man. 
He was a son of God, begotten, virgin born. I'm a sinner saved by grace. His grace saved me. So through that, he opened up a channel by election, a foreknowledge. He opened a channel in my heart to give himself a place there that he could work out to you people. It's your faith that does it, not mine. I couldn't do it. You'd say, Brother Bram, stand up, let me stand up and you tell me what's wrong with me. I couldn't tell you. It takes your faith to do that. The woman that touched his garment went out. He said, Thy faith has made thee whole. Let's speak to him once more. Heavenly Father, tonight with divine, warm, Christian love, we approach thee in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we won't have to stand here hour after hour. Just If you'll just speak to us a little, Lord. If you'll just make yourself known here, and then we'll have prayer, each one. Then we'll believe, and we're going to go out of here tonight with really true, loving fellowship with the Father. We're going out in Jesus' name. Grant it, Lord, for your glory. I submit myself to thee, yielding myself to the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost will do the works of Jesus Christ through this poor, unworthy body. Amen. All right. How do you do, sister? Well, now, the audience, I wish now I'm going to ask you a real favor if you'll do it. People's got to catch your buses and trains. We won't be here but a little bit. ain't necessary. My ministry, I find I haven't found the results yet. I'm trying to change it and get back to just to praying for the sick. Brother Joseph will probably write and tell me. But my ministry is this, that just declares that God is here. It don't matter whether I pray for you or not. In this particular meeting now, it's your faith. It ain't touching me. It's touching him. See, you touch him. It'll happen. How many out there now, so if the audience, your people around, how many wants to be prayed for up here and, and, and wants God to heal you and, and, and you or you're sick and you want God to heal you and you don't have prayer cards and things, you want God to heal you. See? I just believe him and watch what happens. Then if he'd do that one time, when Moses, God told him what he was to do and he went on there and performed that sign before Israel, every one of them believed and marched out. Is that right? Now we ought to believe too. It ought to be just ever, 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 everlasting. It should just be once and you say, that's it. And we are together ourselves together in this loving Christian spirit that we're in. Lay our hands on one another and pray. Get up out of the chair and say, thank you, dear Lord Jesus. I now go with a heart full of love with the assurance that you're almighty God who keeps your word. Amen. That ought to settle it. See? Now, I could take maybe and stand here until midnight. I'd probably get a hundred people through here, but if I could live that long... They wouldn't let me stay because I'd be a week or two coming out of it. See? Now, it isn't when I'm out of it or even when I'm in it. It's between the times, see, when you're just coming out. It's anointing. And if you wouldn't understand what that means, if you've never accepted Christ and know what it means to be anointing, it's another dimension. It's another dimension or another sense. So I, talking to the people, I realize there's a woman here. Now, if there's anything that's said about her, somebody has said it besides me because I don't know the woman. Are we strangers to one another? We are strangers to each other. She's standing here, and that's all I know. She's just standing here. And now, and she's a lot younger than I am, so she was born after I was, and we, we don't, uh, never seen any other before. Now, something's got to happen if, now if it's healing, if she wants healing, I, I'd like to do it, but I can't. Only thing I can do maybe is buy a divine gift, like preaching the word or another gift, prophecy, what, bring her faith up. If God will do it down this prayer line for a peace, will you all assure me tonight that you'll believe Jesus? Assure you your disfellowship with him, and will you do it? Now be in prayer out there. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every spirit in my control for the glory of God. And let everyone be seated just for the next 10 or 15 minutes, please. Don't get up and move around and sit still. Now, sister, I want to talk to you, the first person here tonight, and I want to... To, to speak with you because it's first to get the anointing started. Whether you have faith or not, I don't know. There's nothing we know now. See, we just have to wait to see what the Holy Spirit will say. But if He does reveal to me what you come here for, or something that you, that, um, uh, something that you, you know that I don't know anything about, then you will receive it, will you? Now, sister, all I can do is just be a man. See, that's all I can. It's all I am. Just a sinner and saved by grace. 
Now, I perceive that you are a Christian because you have a, a wonderful feeling to your spirit as it comes meeting me, you see. Now, if it wasn't, it would back off. You see, if you've ever been in a meeting, when sinners come, quickly, it's unwelcome. Critics, you know it right then, see, because it's spiritual, see. But this is supernatural, and you are a Christian. You believe me. You absolutely do. That's right. But now, the next thing is, you could have been a critic, and I wouldn't have known it. See, naturally, but I know it now, see, because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is here. Now, uh, you are here because you want to be prayed for. I see you, um, you're, you're a real nervous person, very upset. And it, I see you all the time holding your, it's a headache you have all the time. You're constantly bothered with a headache all the time. Now, that is true, isn't it? That's true. Now, every one of you ought to believe. Everyone ought to believe with all your heart. Do you do it? Now, see, if I talk more to the lady, more would be said. I can either take one person, long time talk with them, and not bring so many through, but let them come swiftly and bring them all through. It depends on it. Just whatever. Just I've got so much strength, it'll go out, provision. And when that's over, see these men standing here at their post? They'll take me. I don't know when I am and when I'm not. But you believe the Lord Jesus. Let's you and I talk. You seem like a very nice person since you're standing there. And I believe he's already told you what was your trouble or something. Now, you just look this way just a moment. And uh, you're, you're so easy to talk to because I believe you have a real, real faith. That's right. I see you're not from this city. You're from a city by the side of a... Uh, 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 water, but it, it's not this water. It's salt water. And that's way away. You come from the north, east, coming west to Chicago, and you're, you're in a city. I see a name called, it's Portland. Right. And Maine is a, is a state. Portland, Maine. And I see you've got someone there you're interested in. It's an afflicted person. And it's something like a muscular, a bone disease that's afflicted and it's a relative a nephew and then you have a brother also and you've got two handkerchiefs in your hand i've seen them when you got them and you and you one is for a brother who's suffering with a nervous condition and the other is for a nephew who's suffering that's the truth is it all right you believe now all right let me heavenly father in the name of thy beloved child Jesus Christ, who sat at the well and told the woman, go get your husband. She said, I have none. You said, that's right. She got five. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet, sir. I know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. Jesus said, I am he. Father, tonight, you promised us this fellowship, and here we are uh, enjoying this fellowship. The things that I do shall you also. I'll be with you, fellowshipping to the end of the world. Oh, we love you, Jesus. You're here. Grant the request of this woman as I bless her with these handkerchiefs in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you, my sister, and give to you the desire of your heart. How do you do, sister? Supposing we are strange to each other also. We are. Jesus knows us both. Got a back trouble having a little lady sitting there. That's right. Back teeth. Got something wrong with your teeth also. You believe Jesus can make you well? If you do it, you can have it. Okay. You really believe it? You got a good book laying on your lap. If you'll just keep reading that, well, I'll have confidence in you. Amen. God bless you. You believe him with all your heart now. Now we're strange to each other, but not before Jesus, you see. He knows both of us. I just seen something moving. It was somebody moving. I thought it was a, I have to follow a light, see, which is the Holy Spirit. God is a light. They that dwell in God dwell in light. Is that right? You believe that? This lady is standing here. If the audience can hear my voice, I hope that they can at this time. She's, um, she's very sick. She's 
got a, a real nervous condition she's suffering with. And she's, she's had two nervous breakdowns. That's right. And you've just had some kind of a, in your lung, it was a, a pneumonia and a virus. Yes, it had. And I, you've had a couple of major operations, too. It's true. You believe that he's here to make you well now? Yes, I do. Come here. I want to ask you something, sister. You in the condition you're in, and something's here now with me. I'm just a man, you know, I don't know you. But there's something here that knows you. It's working through this body somehow. He said, these signs will follow them that believe if they lay their hands on the sick, they'll get well. You have to do it, don't you? You believe it? Only one thing would be unbelief. Even God's Word tells you first. See? If you, then He lovingly sends something else to encourage your faith. Isn't He wonderful? Yes. I go and get well in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks be to God. You believe, lady? You're very sick. Throat trouble. That's right. There's cancer in the throat, too. That's right. Of course, you knew that. You believe that Jesus make you well, lady? The only hope you have is through Him. If you will believe, God will make you well. You do it? Come here. Dear Heavenly Father, some 1900 years ago, up Calvary went an old rugged cross dragging out the bloody footprints of the barrier. On his road up, his poor little weak body fell. He was bleeding, walking in blood. That's the trail, opening up the doors. His little weak physical body fell under the stream, and there stood Simon the Serene, a colored man, picked up the cross and put it on his shoulders and helped him bear it on. What a dark hour, dark Calvary. Here's one of his children tonight, standing here, standing in the shadows of death. Oh, God. Be merciful. You devil that's killing this woman, in the light of Calvary, I charge thee by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that you leave her with my hands on her, my Lord's commandments. Come out of her. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Are you believing? Just have faith. A little lady sitting here with a little coat over her shoulders looking towards me. She suffers with a lung trouble. Sitting right back over there in the last end of the rows with her hand up. She has a coat over her shoulders. Lady, when I was praying for the colored lady just then, you were praying at the time. Isn't that right? And you suffer with a lung trouble. Jesus healed you even before he healed a woman. You're well now. Your faith makes you whole. Amen. Hallelujah. Just have faith, see. No matter where you are. Believest thou this? Amen. It's her faith. You say, is that in the Bible? Sure. Said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. If thou canst believe. You're looking around the lady there. <laughs> You believe in a God that healed you with the gallbladder trouble and believe he'd make you well? You believe it he would? He did it. All right. God bless you. That's the way I like to see you believe. That's the way I like to see you come. That's still quite faith. Thank God. If thou canst believe, how do you do, lady? Do you believe with all your heart? Well, I'm a stranger to you, lady. I never seen you in my life. But Jesus has known you before you was born. He knows you when he formed your spirit before the foundation of the world. When you were created in the back there in spirit form. Knowing that someday that you'd come on the scene and would stand here on this platform. That's my Lord. He knows all about it. Now you know he's with you. 
you're not from this city, and you're not for yourself. You're standing here for a preacher, and that preacher is a woman, and she's got heart trouble, and she's a Pentecostal preacher. I see her raising her hands back and forth, and she's preaching hard. And something else, she's in the last few days, she's been spitting up blood. Say, that's in a, that's not here. That's in Kentucky, near Covington. I see her go down through by the river there, right? I take that handkerchief and put it on her now for her healing. <laughs> Bless be the tie that binds our hearts to Jesus Christ. If thou canst believe. All things are possible to them that believe. Oh, he is so sweet, so lovely. I just love him with all my heart. I'm sure you do, too. Got female trouble <laughs> setting out on the end, lady. You believe that Jesus make you well? If you believe it with all your heart. You can have it. Just don't doubt. Amen. Very sick lady. A tumor in the stomach. But Jesus can make you well. Do you believe that? Come here. Heavenly Father, be merciful to this woman. Knowing that she's now resting under the shadows of death. But thou can make her well. Grant it, dear God. May thy everlasting love and blessings rest upon this woman as I bless her in Jesus' name. And may she live many, many happy years yet for your glory. Amen. God bless you, sister. Have faith and believe. You believe? You don't look like a Nehemiah, but you are. Do you believe that Jesus Christ will heal him for the pension also? Oh, dear Jesus, I pray that the Holy Ghost will come to this woman and will heal her and make her well. Amen. God bless you, sister. Well, a little grandchild lady that you're praying for there that can't talk very well, kind of afflicted. You believe that Jesus is going to make that child well? You do? <laughs> All right, just don't fear now. Have faith. I've seen the little fellow standing here a few minutes ago. So just have faith. I believe he's going to be all right. Amen. Do you love him? Amen. With all our heart. Lady, you with your hair combed like this, a pink coat on, glasses on, with arthritis sitting there. You believe Jesus would make you well too? Sitting right out the line from the lady there. You believe with all your heart that Jesus would make you well? You believe him? If you do, you can have what you ask for, too. Amen. Oh, he's real if you can believe him to be real. That's right. But you have to believe him. This lady saying you're having sinus trouble. You believe, lady, that Jesus will make you well with the sinus trouble? Lady sitting next to you with varicose veins. Sitting right back here, can't you see? Sure. That's right. There's your hand. Amen. Oh, the sovereignty of God trying to get to one person called for. Isn't that... Isn't he wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How do you do? We strange to each other, sir, are we? We're strangers to each other. You don't know. I'm already hearing you, all right? Come. Bow your head a minute. Oh, Jesus, Son of God. We don't have to see miracles to believe, Lord. The only thing we have to do is to know that our hearts are pure in your sight. But will you open the ear of this man so he can hear what I'm talking about? Grant it, Father. If you'll do this, we'll be thankful. And now, Father, knowing he's a man and he should have faith for himself, but in faith I challenge this devil and I charge thee, thou deaf spirit, Come out of the man in Jesus' name. Leave him. You hear me now, don't you? You love him with all your heart? Amen. I've got your hearing. Isn't he wonderful? 
Wonderful. He sure is. Another thing, you, I see you've got a tumor too, but Jesus Christ can heal you, can't he? You believe that? With all Amen. your heart? Amen. Amen. Your first name is Jerry, isn't it? Correct. <laughs> Man is your last name. And you live in Gary, Indiana. Praise God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Your number is 2689 or 8789, something like Correct. that. That's right, isn't it? Uh huh. You believe now with all your heart? Amen. On Fulton Street, and you just go right on home rejoicing and be praise well in Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say praise the Lord. Praise Lady, you want to go eat your supper? All oh, the old ulcers done gone from you. Just take off and say thanks to people's God. You believe, sir? You know what? That old asthmatic condition would leave you. Quit coughing. Be well if you just believe right now. You believe with all your heart? Then go and stop coughing in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, lady. This old lady's trouble, female, that, oh, you, it's been bothering you a long time, ever since way back in menopause. But is, that's the truth, isn't it? All right, go home now and get over praise it in the, the name of the Lord Thank Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Walk out there at the end of the road and say, the arthritis has gone from me. Amen. And get praise well. Let's say praise the Lord. Praise go eat your supper. Yes. Stomach trouble went away from you. Let's say praise the Lord. You believe? Praise. All things are possible to them that believe. Yes. Yes. If you're a believer, you can receive it. How many wants to be healed? Let's see your hand. If thou canst believe, I believe right now. I'll bring the lady up here. She's standing by me. Well, look, that's us now. Yes, sir. God bless you up there in the balcony. He's sitting looking towards you with that nervous condition. Hold your hand up. God bless you. Yeah, color man sitting way back towards your back. That's right, sir. You were healed right then. Jesus Christ made you well. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I challenge the faith Hallelujah. to look and believe and have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Put your hands over on each other now. We'll settle the whole thing. My faith looks up to thee.